The Democratic Republic of Congo has had you know, decades of conflict, is extremely poor, but on the other hand, it also has very fast mineral resources. There is gold, there's copper, there's everything you can find is in Congo. Both the government and the rebels were all interested in exploiting those. There are many international initiatives, around 11, that all try to break that cycle, how minerals and conflict work together. And in our research, we want to see how those initiatives have worked out in the realities on the ground in the DRC. My name is Dorothea Hilhorst, I'm Professor of Humanitarian Aid and Reconstruction at Wageningen University. Uh, this program is about artisanal mining in Congo, the governance of mining and how all those international programs have worked out. I coordinated the program and there were four researchers. Jeroen Cuvelier, he is a postdoc, he actually looked at the dynamics at the international level. Jose Dimo, she is a uh, PhD candidate, she looked at governance of mining, especially from the side of the government. Then we have Claudi Guma, he worked on governance as well, more from a point of view of what happens when things change in the mining, because there was already an organization in the mining, how did it work out? Finally, there was Rose Parshvira, she was looking particularly at women. Many people think that there's no space for women in mining, but actually there are many women working in the mines and finding a livelihoods, and that is what Rose looked into. Our research very much focuses on one particular international program, which is called the ITSKI, and which tries to make the whole chain of artisanal mining more transparent. So the idea is that you would actually know when you see the final product that you could actually trace back where the mineral came from. That seems like a daunting ambition in a country like Congo where government is so weak and everything. But actually we were surprised to see that quite a lot of things have happened on the ground. However, they don't change in the way that the initiatives are planned. We see all kinds of new realities emerge on the ground that were not planned, not designed and may not even be according to the objectives. There are now many more different officials from the government present in the mining areas. But it doesn't mean that the state as a whole has more oversight, because these operate more like yeah, almost independent people. Another example is cooperatives. The, there was this idea that all the miners should be organized in cooperatives. However, miners were already organized. So what we see is, in reality, a sort of blending of the new cooperatives, the old cooperatives, and out of it comes some kind of institutions that nobody really designed, but it does function to a certain extent. these initiatives to break the cycle between conflict and minerals aim for transparency. Now the way to get transparency is also to be clear who can buy and who can sell. So one of the effects of these initiatives is that there is a much stronger control on who can buy the minerals and therefore there are much fewer points and much fewer people that can buy minerals. Also, to enable this transparency operation, it is easier to work with large companies. What you see is a much stronger concentration of power in the hands of some people who are legally uh, mandated to buy and sell, or the bigger companies, over those vast amounts of mine workers that used to be in those areas. So one of the effects we find from this initiative is increasing inequality. And interestingly, we even find this among women. The few women manage to climb up economically and socially in those mining communities, but the vast majority of women is getting it worse. There is a kind of gap between how we think internationally about this and what is happening on the ground. If you look on the ground, what you see is that those original conflicts may not affect so much the mining at this stage, but you see those other dynamics that come up. Economic concentration, increasing inequalities, 
new institutions that people have to pay to, which also create new tensions. So it seems that the international discourses, and of course it's also logical, are always a little bit behind what is happening on the ground. The fieldwork for this research lasted around two years, in 2013 and 2014, and our main methodologies were qualitative, ethnographic methodologies. So it meant that uh, the researchers went to as many places as they could to actually s observe what is happening and to talk to as many as people as they could, like how they viewed the situation. So the research happened in quite a number of uh, mining areas, but also in Kinshasa, also in the, in the offices of governments, and even in the offices and big international meetings of the International Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD, that holds a meeting on artisanal mining in Congo every year in Paris. And then the team would be there to talk to people, interview them and see what happened. I think we're looking back on a period of extremely rich research. I think we were there at the right time. So many things were happening. These initiatives came to the ground. You saw what is happening, how they bring change, but always different types of change than what we had anticipated. So I think it's really important that we keep monitoring what is happening when these initiatives take place. And we should be daring. Sometimes international donors don't want to evaluate what is happening because they don't want to know that things turn out wrongly, but they should. Because if you do that and you monitor properly, you can actually adjust your initiatives. And there could be, if we th think about it, there could be ways to improve those initiatives so they can adjust to what is happening on the ground rather than the other way around.